Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Susie Orman is my guest today. You already know her for her tough love financial guidance that she's given to us for years. Her show on CNBC was there for 13 years. She is one of the top motivational speakers in the world. She's been described as a one-woman financial advice powerhouse. It is my pleasure to welcome the author of Women and Money, Susie Orman. Girlfriend. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to be here. Women and Money. Now, first of all, I remember back to 2007, this book was a huge success. You sold over a million copies. Now you've redone it, re-released it, updated it. Somewhere in here, I've got to ask, is there a connection today releasing the book to the women's movement, to Me Too? Of course, because even though the book really had millions of copies in print, um, was a number one New York Times bestseller, I have to tell you, in 2007, it might have still been a little bit before its time. Mm. And it's right here and right now that I really believe with all my heart that for a woman to never have to compromise herself in any way, for a woman to be strong, smart, and secure, she has got to be powerful over her own money. That, the, the subtitle of the book, Be Strong, Be Smart, Be, yes. be, be Secure. I read the book. To me, it's finding your power. So what is it that keeps us from owning our power? What keeps us is our nature. Because our nature, Anne, is to nurture. Our mm -hmm. nature is to make sure that we take care of everybody else before we take care of ourselves. Somehow a woman believes that the money that she makes is to take care of her children, her parents, her brother, her sister, her employer, her employees, her pets, her animals, and everybody but herself. Mm -hmm. And it's not until she's about 50 years of age that she goes, but what about me? So a woman says, right, yes, out of fear of what somebody else will think about them versus no, out of love for herself. Is there a, a fight between owning your power and, and maybe appearing selfish? Yes, for a woman there is, not for a man. A man knows very well what to do, how to do it, and who money is for. And they have it right, I have to tell you. Women feel if they say no to somebody and they have something, then they're being selfish versus realizing that sometimes when you say no, it actually helps somebody more than when you say yes to them because you will never, ever, ever solve a financial problem with money. So if you have a financial problem, it's because you have a problem with how you feel about who you are. And it's really just that simple. And that's what Women and Money is all about. One of your passions now, you, you have been working with the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, yes. and, and you have a, a partnership here. There is obviously a financial connection, a connection with women and money and, and domestic abuse. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, it was maybe a year ago now that I sat down with seven women and it was supposed to just be about how they had survived because they were victims of domestic abuse. They knew that they were hit because they had a black and blue mark. They knew when they were verbally abused, psychologically abused. And we taped them. Every one of them had suffered financial abuse, but none of them knew what financial abuse was. And I'm like, how's that possible? And that's when I started to get involved with it. So financial abuse is very simple. Because I don't think I know what that is. No, and, and it's, most people don't. But if you're in a relationship where your spouse or the person that you're in relationship with doesn't want you to have your own credit cards, your own bank account, your own ability to know where money is and everything, and they control every financial move that you make, you are in a financially abusive relationship. And first, somebody has to control you financially so that you have no money. So what they then, when they then start to abuse you physically, you can't leave because you don't have money to leave. 
So every domestic abuse relationship starts with financial abuse. And one out of four women in the United States today suffer from financial abuse. One out of eight women, breast cancer. So think about that. It is rampant, Anne. It is rampant. That is astounding. Yes. I mean, when, when you put it that way. How did you become involved? Was this something that you had thought about for a long time? No. It was, it was simple. It was the domestic violence hotline wanted to bring out the fact of what it's like to survive because domestic abuse was rising and rising and rising. And so they simply asked me as a favor, would I come and interview these women? I said, sure. And I did it just to do it. Because in life, you have to give back. Everything you do can't be because you're going to pay me to do it. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll learn something. And I sat down with them, and one after another, I was like, oh, my God, they all started the exact same way. They all met a man who was so good to them and who showered them with gifts and who took them out to eat and did everything. And then they moved in together. And then the first thing was you weren't allowed to talk to your friends anymore and your parents and and I was like, oh, my God, every one of these is identical. This isn't good. And none of these women knew about it. And they were all sitting there watching each other going, oh, my God, I was in financial abuse. Oh, mm -hmm. it was an amazing experience for me. Financial abuse, that, a, a whole, a whole new term. When you started in the financial arena, I am sure that at the top of your hit list was not I'm going to be a best-selling author. So where did that come, where did the book idea come yeah, from? Yeah, I'll tell you. So first of all, how did I even get in the financial area to begin with? You know, I was a waitress till I was 30 years of age making $400 a month. And so a month or a week? No. A month. A month. Okay. Right? It, it was like a month. Right? And okay. I had been a waitress for 7 years. And all the people I've been waiting on gave me $50,000 to open up my own restaurant, make a very long story short, right? And they told me to take it down to a brokerage firm and leave it there until they could help me open up my own restaurant. All money was lost in three months. And I thought, I can do that. I can be a broker. They just make you broker. And so, <laughs> and so now I become the stockbroker. And Years go on, and now I'm excelling, and I am whatever. And then in 1987, I start my own firm. And now here we are in like 1993, and I have this brilliant idea. I go, I know. I'll write a book to give to my clients as a gift. Okay. And the book was You've Earned It, Don't Lose It. It went on to sell 800,000 copies. Now, I don't think most people know that's in hardback, but that most Authors, they are lucky if they sell 6,000 copies in hardback. They're lucky. And a really good selling author can sell 25,000 copies in hardback. And here I just sold 800,000 copies. And all of a sudden, Susie Orman now becomes an author. And I'm like, what? And then we wrote The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom. And that sold a million copies in hardback in one month. In one month. And before you knew it, it was the courage to be rich. And that knocked me off a year of being number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Courage to be rich knocked me off to number two while it became number one. And at the time, I was one of the only authors in hardback to have the number one and, and number, number two, two. best-selling books. At the same time. At the same time. And the story just goes on from there. It's because, and, and I'm saying this because I, I've read your books, you write with such an authentic voice you are speaking to us, to the majority of us who are no, not Wall Street wizards. No, I'm not wizards. speaking to you. I'm speaking with you. Yes, you are. Because women, it's easy to speak to a woman. And it's easy to speak down to a woman. Because most people do, especially financial advisors. I'm speaking with you. Because I am you. Remember, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. And I was born in 1951. And so that wasn't the time that women worked. But my mama was an Avon rep and was secretary to support the family because my dad was always sick. And so, you know, so I knew what it was like not to have any money. I knew because they had none. And I really thought that the key to happiness was to grow up and have money. 
what a thing to become a stockbroker, <laughs> make a lot of money and still not be happy. So if money's not the key to happiness, then what is? And Susie goes on then, a journey to find happiness. A journey to find happiness. That's also part of this book. Yes. It's a big part of this book. I want to go back to something in the book where you, you, you talked about your personal story, being a waitress, the $400, and I thought it was a week, but it was a month. Um, I wish it were a okay. week. <laughs> might not be sitting here now. You might just, who knows? I guess I'm grateful it was just a month. <laughs> I, I guess so. You, the money that was lost, this was a risk that you took. You, where do you tell us, yes, you can take a risk? This was a risk that I never should have taken. Mm. But because I did not know about money, I believed the financial advisor that I saw when I walked into the brokerage firm. Because every brokerage firm has what's called a broker of a day that sees all the new customers that come in that don't have an advisor. Oh. So here I am, and I'm telling Randy was his name, this money, I don't have any money, I'm a waitress, this money is for me to open up my own restaurant, and I'm supposed to leave it here until everybody mm -hmm. helps me open up a restaurant. And he says to me, how would you like to make a quick $100 a week? And I go, yeah, that's like what I make as a waitress. Mm -hmm. And he said, just sign here on these blank pages. And I did, because mm -hmm. why wouldn't I? I didn't know better. And then when I left, he filled out the paperwork to make it look like I was a very sophisticated investor. And he qualified me to buy and sell options, which is one of the most speculative trading strategies of all. And in three months, all the money was gone. We're talking $50,000. All 50000 But mm. how great is that? Because that happened. I sit here in this chair today. So sometimes when one door closes, another one opens. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing I, I, that I thought was interesting, when I'm reading about your, your growing up with your family, you weren't actually the smartest kid in the class. And I'm you still had, not. <laughs> but you had trouble reading. Yeah, in the South. And here you are, best-selling author. Yeah, and you okay. know what? I've written far more books than I've ever read. Okay. <laughs> I don't like to read. Is that, is, is that horrible? Yeah. I like to write. And once I've written a book, do you want to know something else? I'd never reread it. It is out, done. Done. Next. But what's important about that is that I hope everybody understands that what you say doesn't always have to be perfect. That what you write doesn't always have to be in the correct grammar said in a professional way. Just write how you speak. Women and Money, the title of the book, in my family, we have four generations of females, from five years to 90. My, the 90-year-old still works in her own business every day. In your book, are there generational lessons, or is there advice? Is it ever too early? Is it ever too late? You know, I used to say that it's never too soon to begin, and it's never too late to start. I still believe it's never too soon to begin, but I have to tell you, I don't believe anymore that it's never too late to start. And the reason is, while your 90-year-old may still be healthy and she's working and everything's great, my mama, who is a brilliant secretary, could type 120 words a minute, could take shorthand, at the age of 90, really didn't have her act together mentally anymore. So there comes a time in life when you get older that it could be too late. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but the sooner you can do it, the better. This book obviously crosses all ages, really, all tax brackets, everything. It's a book that gives you a financial empowerment plan mm -hmm. that you can follow. But more than that, it gives you personal empowerment of not putting yourself on sale, of really understanding who you are, and to make finances a family affair, and to, not, and to say that you matter, and it's okay to put yourself first. 
when you said not putting yourself on sale, that when I read that, that was the first time I'd ever seen that in print, actually ever thought about it that way. Very good advice to tell a woman. You know where I learned that? I have to tell you so. I was speaking at some big conference, and the woman in front of me, a very famous woman, gets up there and she's telling everybody how it's good to volunteer, the whole audience of women. It's good to volunteer, and you should do this, mm -hmm. and you should do that. And then I get up to speak, and I ask how many of the women in the audience have credit card debt, and the whole audience stands up. All right, no problem. And I'm thinking, they were just told that they should volunteer, they should do this, mm. they should give of themselves, they should be these loving people all the time, and if they all have credit card debt. And they all have credit card debt because they're, they're spending all their time volunteering and doing all these other things versus taking mm -hmm. care of themselves. And then I was at a male conference. Can you imagine? All men and me. And, and, and I asked them, do you have credit card debt? Do, do you volunteer? None of they, they no. coach their little league, mm -hmm. for, but, but none of them volunteered. And I went, what is this about? They were powerful with money, and they didn't volunteer. Women were powerless with money, and all they did was volunteer. So, and then it was like, oh my God, they're all putting themselves on sale. They're not asking for what they're worth. They're working and giving up their vacations if their employers ask them to. They're, you know, they're bartering, yeah. and, it's, and that's where that came from. You know, there's also a, a generational mindset. I remember my grandparents, who lived through the Depression, were the most conservative people who, I don't think a day went by where they didn't tell you, you don't know what's coming around the corner, you, you know, you, you always need to save, they were never spent there. We lost all of that. I don't know if that's good or bad, but we certainly lost that mindset. We lost that until the year 2008 when mm. everything went down and everybody went through that. But here we are many years later now, and we've forgotten it again. Because during good times, you forget the bad. But as many federal employees learned at the beginning of this year, that you really have to plan. Because if you don't plan, you never know what can happen. Do you know that... 50% of the people in the United States of America today have less than $1,000 in savings. Do you know that? And that's why during that time when the government and everything was shut down and, you know, who knows as we're taping this, it's still, and okay. when it shows, it may still be shut down, who knows, that they, they couldn't go without a $5,000 paycheck. But they were federal employees that had retirement accounts and made pretty good money, most of them, and yet they didn't save any of it. What is that about? What is that about? On your TV show, one of the, I think my most favorite segment was the, was it, Can I Afford Can That? Can I Afford Oh, you are so denied, oh, Anne. I, 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 would, I would sit there and I would tell the people as I'm watching TV, no, you are denied, you can't afford that. A few people actually could, could. but not many. Not many. Um, but Why is it we think we can afford everything? It's not so much that we think we can afford it. We want to be able to afford it. We want to buy those things. We will forever think that things define who we are versus we define the things around us. We think our clothes make us, our car makes us, our homes make us. Everything shows the world how successful we are. No. You have to show the world who you are through your own power and your own security and your own intelligence, and now you're impressing people. Yeah. That takes work, Susie. It takes work if you look at it as work. Or it simply takes the desire that you want to live a life where you feel secure. Because, Anne, what's the goal of money? What mm. is the goal of money? The goal of money is for you to be secure. For you to be secure, that means you have to know about your money. It means you have to be involved with your money. You cannot just be a woman who lets somebody else take care of your money for you. You have got to become a financially independent woman that makes all, that can make, doesn't mean you have to, but could make every decision on your own if you needed to. Can we do a quick lightning round of, of yes and no? It's yes. It kind of goes back, back to your show. 
uh, renting or buying a home? Depends on your situation, really. It's not a yes or no. Really? Yeah. It's, you know, in 2008, people would have wished they had never purchased a home. Today, in this year of 2019, it's, um, I think we're pretty much at the top of the real estate market. So you have to be careful now. Uh, what about leasing or buying a car? Oh, that's easy, buying. Okay. Absolutely have you buying. Ever, you've never leased? N I did. Yeah? Yes, when I didn't have a pot to pee in. That's when okay, I leased. Okay. <laughs> All right, health insurance is crazy. What about, uh, uh, what is it, the, the savings, the HCA or? The HSA. HSA. A health savings account, which is also known as a high deductible. If you work for a corporation that puts in a seed for you, 1,200 a year, 2,400 every year, fabulous. If they don't seed it, it's really a dangerous thing to have. Okay. One thing I never thought I would see in one of your books was dating advice. And you, there, there's a whole thing in here. It's not very romantic, but you think credit scores ought to be shared. You are so proper. <laughs> She's so proper. You know, I said it on the Oprah show, so I can't imagine I can't say it Go here. Go right ahead. Right, so I have a saying, which is FICO first, then sex. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's what she was trying to say. All right. So, your FICO score, which is your credit score, uh -huh. tells your entire story. And if you have a bad FICO score, that says you've been disrespectful of money. And if you're about to get involved with somebody who disrespected their own money, they can take you down faster than you have any idea. The number one reason for divorce in the United States today is arguments over money. So if somebody isn't financially together, <laughs> you better think twice. And that was fascinating to me because I think women don't look at that. Well, nobody really does because, you know, when you first meet with somebody, you're in lust. You're not in love. Love is a heavy-duty thing. We use that word very quickly. But it's not until you've been in a relationship for 15 or 20 years if you know if you love somebody <laughs> or not. Um, but the beginning is all about lust. So yeah. before... Whatever, that's why I'm like, before you know what, FICO first. <laughs> okay. And then, See? then you can do what you want. Then it, maybe it will become romantic that's after right. that. That's right, maybe so. One other thing that, you, that I was very impressed, you're now working with the military, and you, you are advising military families. Yes. First of all, financial situations are, can be scary and can be stressful for anyone, especially military. Yeah. So tell me a little bit a about that. A few years ago, I was named by the Secretary of the Army at that time as the official personal financial educator for the Army and the Army Reserves. Mm -hmm. And for years now, not just last year or two years ago, for 15, 20 years, I've gone to bases all over the world mm -hmm. and I've spoken to the families. I was in Walter Reed Hospital when a uh, uh, you know, a soldier just returned from the sandbox, they called it, with no arms or legs. Mm -hmm. And all he wanted to do was return. And they had me go in and speak to him because mm -hmm. his wife was like, Susie, please, I'm begging you. He wants to return. We can't pay our bills. Maybe he'll listen to you. Mm -hmm. So, listen, the men and women who serve our armed forces, every one of us should do anything we can for every single one of them, because of them, we have freedom today. Yeah. That beautifully said, absolutely wonderful. In your book, In Women and Money, are there maybe two top things that you would like us to come away with? Here's the main thing I want you to come away with. I want you to know that you have a book that you can go to that will speak with you in every aspect of your life. That this book, between the covers, mm. right, holds the key to your true happiness. Your true happiness. Because while I would be the very last person to ever say money alone will make you happy, I'd be the first one to tell you lack of money sure will make you miserable. Mm -hmm. And so to be a strong, smart, and secure woman, there was one place that I would tell you to go to get all of that, it would be this book. Out of all my books I have ever written. 
It was about power. Yes. It was about recognizing power. I didn't actually know that I didn't know my financial power. And now I have tools. Yeah. And so I always say to people, especially women, the biggest mistake you're ever going to make in life are the mistakes you don't even know that you are making. Yes. If somebody says to you, don't worry your pretty little head about it, you better worry your pretty little head <laughs> yes. about it. And I learned this from my mommy as well. We live longer than men. We're killing them off, whatever it okay. is. But we live longer than men. And the time to learn about your money is not when you have suffered an emotional loss and have lost probably the person that you love more than anybody in this world and that you've been dependent on. And now here you are alone. That isn't the time to find out. He didn't know what he was doing either. Yes, Susie Orman is a financial advice powerhouse. She's also a best-selling author. The new book, Women and Money, Be Strong, Be Smart, Be Secure. Susie, I want to thank you so much for this. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next Between the Covers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.